Hello, beautiful teachers, and welcome to your vibrant music teacher chat. This is the weekly show on YouTube where we talk about all things independent music teaching. So today I have a wonderful interview to share with you a little bit later on with Tim Topham about his new book, which is called Notebook Beginners. But before that, we're going to get some extra question time in today. So please do ask your questions. And if you're watching later on the replay, just ask them in the comments. I try to reply to every comment pretty much that I get, every comment that needs a reply. So yeah, please do add your questions in. Just a PSA that this is the second last show of the year. So we will have one more next week on Wednesday as usual. And then we have our holiday break. And then in January, we'll come back, but we will almost definitely be on Thursday at the same time. So same time as this, but Thursday afternoons for me, morning for you if you're in the US and Canada and over that side of the world and still the middle of the night if you're in Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, etc. Sorry about that. But yeah, that's the public service announcement I had to make so that you're aware what's going on. One more on a Wednesday, then Thursdays from there on. We also have our Vlogmas videos on at the moment, so I'm recording videos every day pretty much in December. I'm going to skip a couple of days here or there for various reasons, but most days I'll have a video up. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel and turn on the notifications if you want to make sure that you see those each day. And if you do watch them and you enjoy them, please hit the thumbs up. I know it's hard to remember to do it when you're like around and about, like I watch a lot of YouTube videos in the background, like I'm cooking or I'm sewing or I'm doing something else. And I forget to go over and hit the thumbs up on the videos that I appreciate. So please do, as you go through them, hit that thumbs up button because it shows YouTube that it's a quality video and other people should see it. And yeah, mostly I just hope you're enjoying that and the send off calendar if you're into that. The That can be found at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash send off, all one word. And today's send off video is most people who are familiar with the send-off, we've been doing it, this is our fourth year doing the send-off. If you know most people's favorite part of the send-off calendar, I'm trying to use my words carefully, then that's today. So make sure you don't miss today, okay? If you're having trouble seeing the latest video, which the latest um, door, on the send off calendar, make sure you clear your cache, make sure you're viewing it in a proper browser, not within Facebook or Instagram, because their internal browsers are just not very good. <laughs> That's the truth of it. So make sure you open it in a real browser and clear your cache if you're not seeing the latest day. But as I'm recording this, the day, the door that should open for you has donuts on it. And I put something extra sweet behind there. So let me know if you've seen it already in the chat. Okay, I'm going to get to some questions now before we dive into our interview, and then I'll save more question time at the end in case there's more then. So Carrie asks, where did you get the hydraulic bench that you mentioned in your Vlogmas video for today, which is actually for... Oh yeah, it is for today, the one I just posted. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, that bench, I got it from Toman, which is where I get most musical things. That's a bit of a European thing. I'd say almost all music teachers in Europe get most things from Toman because it's just a huge website. I'm sure they do ship to the US. I don't know whether it's the most cost effective option. But anyway, the website is T-H-O-M-A-N-N, -N, Toman. You pronounce T-H in German, T, not the. Toman.de is their website. And yeah, I got it there. However, I'm sure you can get it more locally if the shipping proves prohibitive from Toman. I don't know whether people in the US ever order from that site. You can let me know. Um, okay, and then where are we? Rose asks, how, where do you store everything? I've already printed out, laminated like 10 games and ran out of space for storing the cards. 10, I have like 500. Um, is it in drawers or anything special I could buy? You know what, Rose? If you watch today's Vlogmas video, um, you which is Vlogmas Day 6, you will see a tour of my studio and I show the area where I organize all my games. We also have a 
article on the Colourful Keys blog about this as well that shows how I store them, like how I put them together, how I print them and cut them out and how I store them in plastic wallet folders, um, which are the ones with the little popper on it. I don't think they're as common in the US because a lot of people tell me they found out about them through me, which is just weird to me. Like, why are they not a common option for you guys? That seems odd to me. Anyway, that's what I store them in. You could use other types of folders. That's just what's common around here. And I put them then in magazine holders. So that's how I organize them into categories. But yeah, again, watch today's Vlogmas video, day six, and you'll see the area where they're stored. There's definitely more than 10. And yeah, some people do filing cabinets though as well. That can be a great option. Just ha didn't happen to suit my space and what's available to me and the expense of filing cabinets. <laughs> yeah, um, I prefer to have them all on display. And I'm also dealing with the fact that it's not just for me, it's for other teachers here. So I have to have a, a system that's very on show. I think is the easiest way to put that. So it's in the waiting room. Hope I've answered that question. I feel like I rambled a bit, but I think I answered it. Um, okay, do you get holiday gifts for your students? How Do you find something that fits for all students and all ages? Well, I'll only answer one of the questions because the answer is no, but I'll tell you why. Um, I don't get any gifts for my students. I'll start with, that's not a thing here. I've never had a teacher of any description, give me a gift. That's just, yeah, it's just not a custom here. Um, I don't know whether it is across the board or whether it's like a music teacher thing, but I see a lot of teachers again in the US and Canada giving out gifts to their students. And I think it's really sweet. Here, the tradition is to give teachers gifts um, in school as well, in every, you would give every teacher you have a gift but none of them would ever give you a gift that's just not what's done so that's my best answer to that one and also I think it's a slippery slope like of course I could do it even though no one else is but then once I do it once I have to do it every year and I just don't think people need more trinkets in their houses I don't think parents would be particularly appreciative if I gave them you know sweets or something okay more sweets if I give them a little ornament or something, it might not be to their taste. I don't know. I don't want to start something that I might not want to continue. So, yeah. Do I ever do one-to-one -one sessions with teachers to go through everything and coach them, guide them with their teaching, etc.? Sorry if this is already on the website. Haven't read about it. Okay, so a couple of things there. Um, I used to have general coaching options available. I don't anymore. We do have something that's only open to vibrant music teaching members, which is called a strategy session. So it's a one off zoom call. And it's kind of given out on a lottery basis. So people apply. And then we I just do one a month. So it depends how many people apply and whatever, but you're kind of in the drawing if you enter for one. So that's one option that is always open. Last year, I did a group coaching semester kind of thing like it was across several months um and so yeah I have no plans to do that next year at the moment so that's not an option but it is something I did do last year okay do I have any tips on transitioning families to vivid practice I'm testing it with one family so far and love it okay awesome so glad you're loving it so far Transitioning families. Repetition, repetition, repetition. That's what it's about. So here's the step by step. First of all, you send out the email and it's an announcement. Okay, frame it that way in your mind. I'm announcing to them that this is happening. I'm not giving them an option. I'm not making a suggestion. I am announcing this is what we are doing. So you send out an email announcing we're now going to be using vivid practice for our practice notes and practice log. You can explain a bit about how that's different to your previous system if it's very different, but keep it brief. Give them their username and their password in that first email. So I've set up an account. 
yeah. You, well, you can manage this the way you want, but maybe you do two emails, but you're going to send them info. This is why we're doing it. This is what we're doing. And I would give them an opt-out as well, because for data reasons, for consent reasons, I would give them another option. But it's not presented like, if you'd like to use Vivid Practice, here it is. And if you want to stick with the old system or you do others, some other system of your own design, you can do that. <laughs> right. We're not leaving it too open. But I would put in a, something further down that says, if you your child does not have access to a device and you can't set this up for them, um, I can email you a PDF of the assignments, but it'll come to your email parent. So, yeah, that would be the only option I would give for parents who are really device, like screen time sensitive or just don't have the resources, don't have access to a device for their child. But send in an email, explain how it works. Follow up with the login credentials and the how-to. We have a how-to PDF that you can send them. It's on the resources page. And then... um. From there, you need to follow up again and again. So in the next lesson with your student, they come in, you say, hey, have you heard we're using this new practice app? And you show them how it works on your phone and you log in as them if you have their login details or just have a test account set up that you can show them. Here's how it works. I tap this, I tap this, I tap this. This is how you start your practice. This is how it works. And then you go back, you know, to the home screen and say, okay, you show me. And they do it. Okay, so they show you that they can do all the steps. Now, there's not that many, but it's really just about reinforcement more than about training. And then they come back to the following week and you check in the statistics and you say, if you see like they practiced four times this week and they use block practice mode like you asked them to. Great. Everything's going swimmingly. And you just say, awesome job using the app. Is there anything you find confusing or difficult that I can help you with? If they haven't done any practice, it doesn't look like they've logged in, ask them, did you use the app? Did you have trouble accessing it? Talk to the parents if it's a device issue. If they say, yes, I did, it normally means they tapped view only. So just show them again how to tap practice, tap blocked. And then from there, it's about following up again and again and again and again. (laughs) It takes a lot of reinforcement, but any practice system does. This is where people hope that using an app might fix their practice issues. It's not going to fix every issue. It can make things more efficient. It can make things more um, easier to use multimedia, you know, to have audio and video. And it can make their practice structure better, but it's not going to be a cure-all, right? I'm sure that's not what you're expecting. So just like you would have to reinforce reading a notebook, if they're going to actually read the notebook, you'll have to reinforce this. Glad you love the donut door. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, you're not in the US. I just always mention it because people are like, what plastic folder? What are you talking about? Um, like poppers? <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, hope it's helpful. No, I don't give Christmas cards. I did cards one year um, at the end of the year as a like, I appreciate you card. I did that during COVID um, when I wasn't seeing them in person. I think cards are lovely to do. (laughs) Yeah, well, if you apply, you know, I look forward to speaking to you if your names get strong. So that's great. Okay, I think I've caught up with the questions. So add in more and I will come back to them at the end. But right now I'm going to share with you our main topic for today, which is about no book beginners. So on the show today, I have a fabulous interview to share with you that I recorded with Tim Topham. Many of you will know that I've worked with Tim in the past and we're good friends. Tim is down in Melbourne in Australia. So down in my mind, I realize it's not actually. Um, And he has just released a new book about his no book beginners approach. So I took the time to sit down with Tim and do a little interview about his book. So Tim, you got this new book out, but I want to jump way back to the origins of this whole thing. I want to know when the first time is that you tried teaching a student without using a book. Can you remember? I 
can definitely remember. Uh, thank you for having a chat with me, by the way. Um, his name was Josh, and I actually mentioned him in the book. Um, and he, I reckon this was around 2015, I, I want to think, think it is. And it had come after about six months worth of me chatting to lots of people, doing a whole lot of research, diving into all kinds of Kadai and music learning theory and all those different approaches and trying to come up with a lesson plan that would work for for this this kid josh who was fantastic but he was like your total regular he was i think he was seven at the time you know he was into sports and like normal kind of kid and but really musical and i really just wanted to give him a different approach something different i didn't i knew he wasn't going to respond to that whole that's there's middle c on the first lesson so that's about when it all started but of course the genesis was long before as i tried out all these creative things in the lessons yeah absolutely so then thinking back to that first lesson you you made this plan you knew you had the research behind you but going into that first lesson without a book in front of you were you nervous were you excited were you confident how did you feel about it a bit a bit of everything i wasn't actually that confident to be honest uh i I knew the ideas would work, but I hadn't tried it before. So it, it like doing anything for the first time, it's a little bit scary. Uh, but I had, you know, there were elements of the lesson, which I had tried out with other students and things over the previous years. Um, so it was just a matter of, of, of checking it out. But as soon as he was in there and I was like into the non-reading stuff and trying these games and clapbacks and doing a bit of singing and stuff, he was off and we were both laughing laughing and enjoying things and I never really thought about it after that. Yeah, amazing. I mean, it's good to hear that, I think, for teachers who are trying this for the first time that even Tim was like yes. not super confident about it, right? Whenever we try something new, it's going to be a little bit nerve-wracking or a little bit scary. So yeah. what are the benefits then that you've seen come out of this? Why should we consider starting without a method book? There are, oh look, there are so many, but just to pick out a few, one is normalizing creation, curiosity, and things like singing right from the start. I have always had trouble when I bring on transfer students that they're terrified of singing. They're you know, absolutely petrified and won't do it until I start singing and you know I eventually cajole them into doing it. One of the things we can do if we're singing and normalizing that right in that first lesson and those first few few lessons, then it becomes just a normal part of what we do in music lessons. And if, and we all know that singing is hugely powerful to students' ability to understand music. Um, and I know you're you know you do this yourself. Uh, singing and movement really really important. So that's that's one thing. But also just if you remove the reading, you can understand your student so much better and and get a sense of what are they like. What, what do they enjoy? What's their sense of rhythm like? Uh, can they sing in tune? Can they match a pitch and things like that? Oftentimes all of that's left until what they're doing grade one <laughs> exam and suddenly they've got to do oral tests and it's like, oh, actually my, <laughs> my student can't actually sing a note that I play. What have I done wrong? Well, the thing that you haven't done anything wrong, but the thing we can change is to go, let's do some of those oral activities pitch matching, rhythm matching, singing, movement, hearing tonic and dominant relationships, home keys, all of those things. Let's do them in those first lines rather than worry about the reading. The reading can come later. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is all too familiar a scenario, especially for teachers who do teach in like an exam system where the student is suddenly a few weeks before their exam preparing for their oral tests and you go, oh my gosh. They can't sing. Like they can't. I really should have started. Like they're speaking. They're not even (laughs) singing. Um, Yeah. yeah. So that can be really tough. So you mentioned singing and a few, a little bit of what you might do. Can you give us an overview of the kinds of things you would do with a beginner when you're not using a book? Mm. Well, we've, I've literally laid it out. So we've got up to 10 lessons worth of this. And in fact, the lessons are jam packed. So this could easily take longer than that if you wanted to, but you can easily just drive into one or two lessons. But the kinds of things we're doing in that very first lesson, obviously getting to know each other, uh, finding out what they can play. Doesn't matter if it's 
Fur Elise and you hate Fur Elise, or it's Mary Had a Little Lamb, or it's Chopsticks, you jam along, you get excited about it, uh, and you help them with it. We're also doing really simple technique exercises, which is to say, getting them sitting at the piano the right way, getting them the right height, just those those basics. I don't worry too much about exact hand positions and things right in that first lesson. That can be developed again later on, but getting them sitting at least the right way. And then we're going to make music. We're going to improvise. And the easiest way to do that is on the black keys. And so I've given you some accompaniments you can play. Uh, and we've also got backing tracks if you're not confident with the um, accompaniment playing or you want to hear a fully orchestrated backing track, you can put that on. The great thing about the backing tracks is that the student can then go ahead and do more of that when they get home because I think that's one of the other challenges teachers who might try this will think, well, if they haven't got a book in front of them, what are they going to do at home? And so we actually do, I specify, here's what you can your your student can go on and do when they're at home. So those are the, that's kind of the first lesson. And then we keep building on that. It's really structured and sequential. So we add a little bit more improvisation. We'll add a few more notes. We'll play a game. Uh, we have this around the world improv activity that starts about week four. They get a little motif uh, that's reminiscent of different cultures around the world. They create uh, an improvisation based on that. And then they build, they make a passport so they can put their composition in it. And we can have a product at the end of that activity. We introduce rope, a rope piece later on from the amazing Paul Adrea, who I know is a friend of yours as well. So there's just a whole lot of different activities that just build slowly, sequentially, these skills that that we want them to have. Um, oh, we also have we have a folk tune that they learn to clap the rhythm of the words of and keep a beat while they're saying the words, and then they sing it. Um, and there's lots, there's just <laughs> there's so much to do. There's almost too much to do. So I've had to really sort of structure it and pare it back. Um, but just keeping students engaged and motivated and most importantly, creating. Every lesson is full of creativity. Yeah, absolutely. And they're definitely jam-packed lesson plans, but that's the same style I have, which is give a little bit too much in the lesson plan mm -hmm. so that teachers can pick and choose or can extend it beyond the 10 weeks if they want to. Um, the worst feeling exactly. is not having enough to do, so yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it's you definitely want to have too much and let that... Uh, flow onto the next lesson and then be stuck wondering, oh no, what do I do? Or we better get the method book out. And I should say, Nicola, too, I've got nothing against method books. Method books are absolutely brilliant. They are the best, most structured way of teaching a student to learn to read music that you can possibly find. All I'm suggesting is let's just get to that after a few weeks. Let's do some other activities first. Yeah, absolutely. So let's come back to that, that idea of reading. You mentioned, you said slight, uh, briefly earlier, oh, reading can come later. But what about reading? Isn't that super important? Shouldn't we be teaching students reading skills? When does that come into the picture for you? Yeah, absolutely. We should, we should be teaching students reading skills. But, you know, if you think of all the different ways that people have engaged in music in history in the past, Generally speaking, the first thing people do is play. They, they will pick up an instrument and try and play it. They'll strum some chords, they'll sing, whatever it is, uh, in, this, in a similar way to the way that we learn language. And I don't want to go into too much detail, but um, <clears throat> generally speaking, the best way to learn a language is to engage in it first and speak and babble and try to make noises before you get to the reading and writing. So all of that is to say, yes, reading is important and it's a great skill to have. Uh, but again, we just don't need to focus on it right up front. We can just have a whole lot of fun. I mean, if you think about it, you know what, if you went into a lesson and you had one teacher who sat you at the piano and opened a book and pointed at the music and said, that's where C is on the piano. Can you play that and hold it for two counts or whatever it is versus a, a teacher who says, right, what would you like to play? What can we play? Let's play something together. And, and then, oh, wow, you know, you can make up this cool stuff on the black keys and let's put the pedal down. And why don't we open up the piano and see what it does inside? I mean, there's just, oh, <laughs> it's just so much fun you can have, but or more, most importantly, it's meaningful fun. You can learn and ingrain these musicality skills with students. Um, before they get to the reading. Did I answer the question? I think I might be going off on tangents. <laughs> no, no, I think you did. I think you did. Um, you're making me think, though, like exactly that. It's so much more fun and engaging. And um, you talked a little bit earlier about developing the relationship. It makes me think of a friend of mine who did piano lessons for several years. Have you asked her 
for what she remembers from that now, she would remember two things. She would remember that a piece that I taught her by rote outside of lessons, because I had been learning longer <laughs> than her. So she could still play that. And she would remember this is C, middle C, left hand, right oh hand, middle God. C. Like that is what she would tell you. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that teacher. It's just like it was a standard approach that she was following. And I'm sure I started the same way and I just went further. But there is a much more fun way that we can approach lessons in the beginning, I think. Yeah. And you know what? If, if you ask a lot of adult students who learned piano when they were younger and quit at some stage, well, the first thing they'll say is, I wish I never quit. The second thing they'll talk about is why they quit. And yeah. generally, it's as you've, as you've said, it's those monotonous, the focus on reading or whatever it is. If you dive a little deeper, the next thing they say is, but I really enjoyed trying to work out music on, from, that I heard on the radio while I was meant to be practicing or whatever. And, and they'll have these moments, a lot of, a lot of adults, where they've, they'll think back and go, oh, it was all that playing by ear and making stuff up and listening to what was on the radio and trying to copy it and things that, that they loved and they remember from their lessons. So I'm just saying, well, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, those skills are amazing. Being able to play by ear, transpose, transcribe, all those things, they're, they're great skills. Why don't we actually encourage that in our lessons and help the students with it alongside doing some of the things that we know they should be doing as well? Yeah, exactly. But I think that's a lot of what both of you, you and I try to do is to bring those two things together. I mean, thinking about talking to adults, I talked to adults who had classical lessons and they're so jealous and in awe of people who can play by ear. And then I talked to traditional musicians, our traditional musicians who are totally bamboozled by sheet music and are in awe mm. of those people. So it's trying to bring those two things together. And I think mm. starting without the focus being entirely on reading <laughs> does go a long way towards developing that overall approach I think so mm. Tim what ages do you think this works for is it for everyone are there certain types of students that you wouldn't do this with like any element of teaching you always want to judge whether the students whether this is right for the student and you'll get a pretty good feel of that pretty quickly if you try it out so some students with neurodiverse different neurodiverse sort of backgrounds and things may may need a more structured approach than this potentially. Uh, but generally speaking, most students aged between about six and 11, I would say, uh, perfectly suited for this method and the approach that we use. We have had teachers use elements of this in group lessons, uh, use elements of this for teenagers, but the, a lot of the stories and things would have to be altered for adults. Um, you can still use the, the concepts. You just need to change the way that it's presented, I guess. But yeah, six, six to 11, maybe 12, depending on the maturity of the student, uh, is absolutely perfect. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it depends also on the approach of the teacher. Some teachers definitely get away with doing games and telling silly stories with adults just by going into it saying, look, I know this sounds silly but yes, it's really going to help, you know. So I yeah. think you can expand it in a way that feels comfortable to the teacher, but great to know the core age range. Mm. And what about uh, transfer students then? Have you ever taken this approach in the beginning with students who have some experience? Not so much. You would, you would really... I mean, there are elements of the framework, activities in there that you could use with any student in that age group who comes to you, even if they've had six months or maybe a year with another teacher. Uh, I still think ideally it really is designed for taking on a fresh beginner. That's that's the approach. And it literally is step-by-step step through almost a script, like kind of what to say and do in each of those lessons right from the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. I think though, if teachers take this and run with it for new beginners, it could inform the way they teach other students um, and they can take elements of what they're doing and less focus on books maybe in the beginning with even students with, who have some experience or the adults, like you say, or et cetera. Yeah. And I think as well, you can, you can take, there's no, I've always in all the approaches, suggestions, frameworks that I've put out there into the world, I've always said to teachers, you can take this and use it as suits you. I don't, sort of say, right, you must do 10 weeks of this or it's not going to happen or whatever it is. So if you want to try it out with a student and just try lessons one and two and see how it goes, then go for it. 
and then maybe start introducing reading on the side. You don't have to do all the 10 weeks. And in fact, a lot of our members who use it uh, may only use up to weeks five and six-ish, and then they'll use some of those activities like the Around the World one and see that through. Um, but it is super flexible. You can choose how you want to do it. I'm not suggesting you ditch all your methods and change everything. Just try it out. See, see what response you get. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Tim, and sharing a bit more about the No Book Beginners approach. Tell me, where can people go get the book and find out more about this approach? Very easy link. And thank you very much for having me, Nicola. It's been a pleasure catching up with you as well. Uh, the link to find out more and download your copy. So it's downloadable uh, as a PDF. We also have an audio book and it will also be on Amazon uh, if you want the physical copy as well. And the link to find out that and everything about it is topmusic.co slash book. Easy. Nice. Nice and simple. Topmusic.co slash book. And we'll put that in the description, of course, as well. Thanks again, thank Tim. So no worries. Thanks. See ya. I'm back in real time. <laughs> okay. I hope you enjoyed that interview and it gave you some thinking points. I know many of you will know Tim's approach, like the Notebook Beginner's approach, because it's something, it's a course that's been on the top music site uh, for a while, but now he's codified it kind of into a book. Um, and I think it's exciting to have it in format. I love that it's available in audio as well, because I'm just an audiobook fan, especially for nonfiction. I prefer reading fiction. Don't know if any of you are the same, but I prefer listening to nonfiction. So it's great that it's available that way as well. And yeah, I hope you enjoy it if you check it out or just use the idea of, hey, maybe I don't need a book from lesson one, because that's something I've really picked up and run with in different ways in sci-fi music teaching as well. Like, uh, is there a different way we could begin lessons and would we be better off? And I asked about transfer students there because that's even more true for me for transfer students. I want to see them read a little bit, but I don't want to commit to any kind of book for a good while with my transfer students because that's where we run into huge trouble, isn't it? They come in, they say, I'm already in this book and you go, great, I'll just pick up where your last teacher left off. And then you realize, oh, they don't know this, they don't know that. I would have expected that at this level and they're missing these foundational pieces, so I prefer to work with them without a book for a little while. Anyway, that's me, so I hope you find that interesting. Do let me know if you have any extra questions now, and I can stick around for a few more minutes. So, any questions, just write them in the chat, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. I know I answered a few earlier already, but if there's last-minute ones you want to add in, please do let me know. Um, yes, absolutely, it does explain everything. I mean, he's taken some of the lesson plans, the beginning lesson plans, I can't remember how many it is, so I won't say, and put those in the book, so it's very clear on what to do. Um... I'm not sure I would call that a large book, but yeah, it's, it's a good size. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, Ashley was asking during that about the handshape comment that Tim made about like not too fussed in the beginning. If they get the handshape right, I can save that for later. I think I maybe introduce it. I would prefer to start it earlier than Tim is talking about there, but still for me, the first lesson or two, not a big deal to me if they're doing silly things with their hands because we're playing pieces where that doesn't matter if that makes sense like we're playing pieces that are designed to be played with one finger any finger and I want them to get the idea that they can explore the instrument and if we start by saying okay make a you know a rounded hand shape look after your little critter underneath if I start that all from the beginning it kind of introduces this tension which is the opposite of what we want that's just how I think about it anyway um yeah exactly we want to know where to put like not every student is the same especially older beginners absolutely some students age nine or ten will be absolutely great in a book that's designed for like teens or adults and some students age 11 will need the like slower pace of a beginner of a book that's not designed for their age group so yeah 
Rose, weird question, sorry. Don't mind weird questions. Are there options to pay for 101s together? I'm just so overwhelmed. So this is related to the question earlier about uh, coaching. There's not at the moment, that's the simplest answer I can give you. There's not um, a specific option for paying for coaching with me at the moment. Um, yeah. Sorry, I can't help more with that, but apply for the strategy session if you're a member and hopefully I'll be able to meet with you that way. Okay. And in the meantime, ask questions via text. Like I'm very happy to answer as many questions as you have. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up there, folks. So I hope you continue enjoying Vlogmas and you can catch up on it if you haven't known about it till now. All the videos are on the channel, so just click through to the Colourful Keys channel and you'll see them all there in a playlist. Um, I'm going to keep doing them almost every day as we go forward. And then we've one more live show left this year. So I hope you can make it next week. We're going to be talking about practice again, talking about ways specific things that I write in students' notes and specific things I include with their notes to help them practice better. Hope uh, you have a great week and I'll see you next time.